It is my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Rogers, who I've known in the law school. The lecture uh, title is Borrowing from Lawyers Dispute Resolution Practices to Reduce Bitter Divides Within Communities. Rogers, of course, better marriage, and is on the of the Moritz College of Law Divided Community Project. First joined the Moritz faculty, he has served as the Ohio Attorney General, Moritz College of Law. Academic administration, a visiting professor, Harvard Law School, and associate dean for academic affairs at Moritz. Prior to joining the faculty, he was a law clerk for a federal judge as practice at the Cleveland Legal Aid Society. He was a graduate of the University of Kansas and the Yale Law School. Works for a lifetime contribution to the, to the dispute resolution field in from the American Bar Association section on dispute resolution, the American Arbitration Association, the International Institute for Conflict Prevention and Revolution, and the International Academy of Mediators and National Award from Dispute Resolution. Books and two articles. He received awards professional service from state and local bar associations and civic. That's a lot. Nancy, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and also, an old friends are on Zoom. Uh, an opportunity that is really unique at the university to get interdisciplinary questions and feedback on the work that, that we're doing. So I'm, I'm grateful for this opportunity. And I wanted to take you back just a few years, about a dozen years ago. I left, I was on leave from the university to, to be uh, a public official and came back. And when I returned, my colleague and your fellow Emeritus Academy member Josh Solberg uh, said to me that he would like to do something related to the way that our communities have become not only divided, we've always been divided in our communities, but bitterly so, uh, and um, the way that it was affecting what was going on. And he, he had some experience as a community-wide mediator. Um, I came back, interestingly enough, but coincidentally enough, with the same desire, having watched uh, and been part of uh, during law enforcement part of my job, um, dealing with communities that had had police violence uh, against residents um, and watching the way in which uh, leadership sometimes responded as though it wasn't uh, a situation in which communities were polarized and it wasn't a real conflict. Uh, sort of a business as usual, not, not uh, out of malice, but out of simply habit, uh, worried in the midst of a conflict and maybe using the same methods they'd always use. And so I too had some idea that if we could figure out how to do it, um, we, what we were teaching in law school uh, about how you resolve disputes collaboratively, and pull from that and help those leaders through to deal with what is to them a new kind of time. So that's, that's how it started. Um, and um, what we said to each other we'd like to do is to inform their leadership practices in such a way that, uh, that they could build more resilient communities or trusting communities, communities that would humanize each other more, uh, but also so that they could, in the midst of a divisive 
incident so that they could maintain trust, but also use that energy to achieve some progress. Uh, and um, and so what we did was uh, was to think of ourselves as, as coming from the law school. But the reason that this is really going to be, I hope, such fun to do together is that we don't own these concepts in law. We simply apply them. And just to give you an idea of how broadly at the university these concepts are being taught, um, um, this is just this semester, just undergraduate courses. And you can see how the dealing with conflict are taught throughout the university. Um, and as we've gone forward with this project, we are now dealing with people uh, from eight or nine different units um, on the campus who are working with us and do fully understand these concepts that we're going to be talking about today and talk about translating for use in the community. So it really is an opportunity for us as a university to reach out from what we know and study and to be helpful, at least in some small ways, uh, in what is going on throughout. What I, the way of what we've done, our approach to it, is to think of translating that we know and teach um, in three different ways, three different levels of translating. The first is up with promising ideas. That's and, that. some of them. Uh, and so what we tried to do was um, we, uh, I was teaching a class of students. I said, what from what you've learned in dispute resolution, those who are studying for our certificate, what do you think applies? Let's just talk about this, spend the semester doing it. And then why don't you write something about what you think is applicable? We'll gather about 40 people who are leaders. And when we talk about leaders, we talk about leaders at all. I touch it and there is a little speaker in no and um and let's see if what they think of what you put together, you students put together, whether they think it makes sense. Or they make there should be a box that allows you practical, to practical or not practical. Change the speaker. And so that process yielded what we could synthesize and what we conclude were some of the promising ideas. We retested those with even more leaders and began to synthesize them. So that's sort of the part one translation. The part two translation was as difficult, and I'll talk about that in more detail in a minute, which is they didn't necessarily wait out there to hear from Ohio State University about how they ought to leave. <laughs> in which we began to learn how to reach Audio. out in ways Nothing. that it would that would be trusted, number one, and also that they had time to hear. Um, and then the third sort of translation process, so that's part two. And this is, uh, you might help me where I, I can't get it to me. And part three um, was that um, we knew that this process, um, we were making some guesses, uh, which is why we only call them promising ideas. Um, they, were, they were processed, we'd spent time on them, but we had not looked systematically at whether they're right. And so more recently, we have also been doing research and then updating, putting out new additions because we feel sometimes we've been wrong um, and the research is showing that we should leave people. Um, so I want to say that I am one volunteer um, out of many volunteers, and we have a staff. Uh, Carl Spock is the director of the Divided Community Project. Um, Bill Froelich below is the deputy director. And as we began this project, we began by writing about it quite a bit uh, to get more input nationally. And and I, um, a number of the people who commented on the articles said that they would like to help and they became our initial steering committee and have stayed with us. They are volunteers from across the country who share our interest in dispute resolution and our worry about the country. 
It's a maybe. That would be great. So going back here, I want to talk just three examples, how we move them from an idea we had to we think to hearing from people and finally coming up with the promising ideas. Um, and of course, involving them, uh, as I say, we think of them, sometimes we say to each other, who are the public officials who would be involved and who are the president uh, of the Bar Association that might be the most influential lawyer in the community, uh, who people look to, who they trust. It might not be the head of the Urban League, it might be a faith leader. Um, and so we try to find those kinds of leaders to listen to, because ultimately, at the bottom, leadership often takes place very strongly in situations where trust has disappeared, when unlikely allies everyone on the list plus more are speaking together. Uh, they may disagree about some things, but speaking with one voice on others. Um, and so this, these are the groups that we would bring together to listen. So, you know, this is a concept that I'll bet half of you have taught, but all of you know, uh, which is that in a situation where trust has dissipated, it's far more important to make sure that people know you've listened, to listen to them, Oh, you understood what they have to say, uh, that you care, that you, you are confident that their, their views are going to be heard. And so the question was, what are the ways that we can translate that in a variety of settings? And so we start with uh, some work we did with the Mershon Center. And that was, what, what about these symbols conflicts? And, you know, the name of the building becomes controversy of the street, the statue, the flag. Um, is there something, are there some ways in which we can translate something like this to that, uh, to that setting? And this is simply an excerpt from the guide that uh, is, is excerpt there at the top that Rashawn and the Divided Community Project put out. And it notes that in this context, um, it isn't listening means consulting. Um, it means bringing them aboard, getting them to know each other, not just those who have a stake in it, but those who are the bridge builders among all the community. Um, and then to seek their help in constructing the communication. Uh, and when you make decisions, let the public know that. And then the public knows that their views are being heard and understood. So it's a way of translating that um, on an ongoing basis in providing that concept from a leadership position. And you can move it forward. The second kind of idea, again, you know this idea so well, um, <laughs> is that there's some power in conflict in summarizing and then reframing in order to both promote the understanding of people who are in conflict with each other. What's going forward as a problem solving agenda? Uh, and so an example of how we found that people helped us to translate that for university leaders, another of the groups that we work with, was in the midst of a divisive incident, uh, perhaps a hate incident. Um, in other parts, you need to get the statement out urgently and repeatedly. But in what has occurred so that people really all have the same information in, in the words that you can use to describe it, um, that you recognize the impact of that, um, recognizing that the impact may fall differentially on different people within the university, but that we all care about all of them, um, that you describe what the issues are um, going forward, um, and that in fact, you announce decisions where you can, um, uh, so that you are being responsive um, in this summarization and reframing, and indicate where the decision makers are, um, and then identify what values and what process the university will use going forward. Um, and all of that, not like you usually speak. It needs to be in a different 
know that you are authentic, that you feel the urgency they feel, that this is not another day. Uh, we're not. In which people are hurting. This is a day in which people don't feel safe. We all care about those people. And it has to have that voice, that, um, uh, that sense of urgency. So that's a translation that we did after much consulting. Uh, and I'll give just one more example because uh, there are so many. And I think you know them intuitively. Um, it, it's to remind people of what they share, to, to humanize it. What we are very worried about, and I, I bet some of you as well, is um, that there is a sense of demonizing particular groups. Uh, and it seems to work seems to work well to raise money on social media. Uh, seems to work well for foreign governments to, to um, try to undermine our democracy using to, to make us think that we share no values that the other people are nothing like us, um, that, that we are, whatever it might be, that, that is a common frame. And so there are ways in which um, mediators and others try to deal with that phenomenon by reminding people that they share a great deal that they all care about their children. They care about the same things. Everyone wants to be safe. Um, everyone wants them to be, uh, wants to live in a fair situation. People want to be able to vote. These are things, these are values that we share. Uh, and so one response was to create an entire uh, guide on identifying that spirit, the common aspirations. But second, we're to, to try to, to bring it down to a level in which leaders could use on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and part of it is what we started with, which is to say, there's so much more power when people know that people who have their values and views have been included in the decision-making and are included in the statements going out. For that to happen, that needs to happen on an ongoing basis, to be a kind of kitchen table where all of us know each other, we, we trust each other as people, we can say candidly, yes, I can get on board on that part of the statement, uh, as long as you don't say this other thing. Um, we can together say no violence, and together say we care about this community. Well, and um, so that's one of the things that, that we think humanizes it for others, and research does show that even when something as simple as two opposing candidates announce that they will together with respect, that they are both going to accept the election results and to explain why that's important to democracy. That can humanize. There are lots of forces pulling us apart. So those are just you know few of the examples. Um, to and feel free now to, to ask questions both online and uh, and in person. But, uh, because I think you know where I'm going. So this is. This is another other suppose we think we have some wisdom to share um, and we're going to share it in some humble way. How in the world do we do that with a, so, so many people who are involved? Um, and of course, we never dreamed we would reach them all. That That's never been... Uh, something we, we thought of, but we wanted to reach a lot of them. We wanted to make as big a difference as as we could. Um, and so we we began to think why, when this is the concepts we thought we were putting out were pretty common sense. Applied them a lot over your lives. One of the things we heard from those who have been mediating for the U.S justice and civil rights disputes in communities was that people who are in communities that have not had a recent get it wrong in the early hours and they have to live with what they did, their decisions in the early hours for the weeks and months that followed. And so we said, well, why don't they prepare? Why don't they think about it ahead? Uh, it's the only reason they prepared at all 
they said when in their experience was if they would had an, an incident, they realized what they'd done wrong and they were never going to repeat that. Get them to to do that, but we began with an understanding that that is difficult to do. They are facing emergencies every day, and this incident, this divisive incident, may never happen. Whereas they're dealing with things that have already happened, and so here we are saying, uh, think about this like you think about a possible earthquake. Uh, that I think was was really a major problem. But also, each community feels unique. They are busy and and what they do, um, and um, they're not even to, to, for people to know that they've talked to a group called the divided community would be a good idea, because it's admitting that their community is, they're very positive people, they really don't want to do. So those were, those were the headwinds we thought we were facing, um, and what we did was, was to try to um, to do several things, but I'm just going to give you a couple examples where we thought we, we've come up with some ways that work despite these challenges. One is fun. Two is a community building thing within their own um, staff, because of course, otherwise they're going to go to high road build this, sort of do some team building. Um, and then third, they don't have to listen to us. They come up with these ideas in their own voices. And so we um, have students who, who help write simulations that are, because the students are involved, are really fun. You know, in which, you know, you say, gee, I don't think, I don't think that they're going to, and then all of a sudden there's a news commentator coming on saying violence has started in the, in this university building. Um, so instructions to, to the, um, the mayor's team, some of the community leaders. But we give them ahead our guide as to ideas, promising ideas that they could use. And because they're going to do this in front of their mayor the next day, they do typically read our guide, which is the only way we really ever get it read. So then they come in and they're sharing our ideas with each other. We then half the time for that, and we say, suppose community next week, what is on your agenda that you would want to get done before then? Uh, and they come up with the ways in which they are prepared, uh, and often they're exchanging things that the others didn't know. Did you, did you know that we always empty the trash on what we think are the four or five likely routes, because otherwise somebody will throw something in and start a fire. You know, no, I didn't know that. So some of it's sharing, but much of it is noticing that there is something missing. They create those agendas. We offer to be in touch uh, a few months later and get a report back, uh, and often they do that. And so we, we keep The other is we've noticed that they, they have time to go to a conference once a year. So we try to become that conference. And one of the things we've noted is that it's hard for a single person, just as it's hard for us to go into a community, it's hard for a single person in the mayor's staff to be the one saying you should. So we require them, if they come, they can come free. We even pay their way sometimes if we can get a grant. and but they have to be admitted. And to be admitted, you have to have a leadership team that includes some from the community, some law enforcement has to be there, somebody from the mayor's office who's in, gonna be in the room as you make decisions. And um, we uh, provide some instruction, um, but we break up each unit with time for them to talk to each other time for the police chiefs from one town to talk to all the police chiefs that have gathered and share what their reaction is to what they just heard and apply it. By the end of the time, um, they have an agenda for their community based on any ideas that they've learned over three days with, with us. We 
So they get to know each other and come in with questions, the kind of things they're hoping to learn about. And we shape their learning to the questions they raise. And then we, a few months, and amazingly, they show up and they give reports uh, and ask questions. Um, and then a day like today at two o'clock for all those groups that have come to our academies, and it's now around 600 people, we announced two o'clock, we will be available to talk about what's happening in your communities in response to um, the, uh, the killing in um, so they did that. Uh, several people from Memphis uh, City were on, on the phone and people sharing, police chiefs, others sharing their experiences and exchanging viewpoints. Um, a third approach um, is that we just uh, work our way in through a trusted counterpart. Um, and we have a grant that allows us to contract with former mayors, former police chiefs, who are mediators and also from retired mediators from the Community Relations Service and the Justice Department. This worked for a living and all of them have very strong Rolodexes. We have students who watch for hot spots um, and sometimes it's as simple as we simply mail that we just email someone with a guide, but often it's a conversation. Is there a police chief who knows the police chief in that community? Mediators and our former uh, police chiefs and our former mayors often know that. They work their way in and then they offer confidentially because they know it will be embarrassing and free so that they don't have to worry about just buying an expenditure. Uh, we make a consultation available. Uh, sometimes ignored, sometimes really embraced. Um, so that takes us to the research and you know, one of our initial questions was really if we if it made any difference. Uh, and so we simply hired um, people who could do outside independent to do qualitative research in the cities that would look who, who had already disclosed that we'd been there. Um, and so some had announced it, and uh, uh, there were articles in the paper about it that we had been there. Um, and so we 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 do in those limited ways, keep checking and, and uh, judging the differences that we're making. Um, and then we are also um, looking more systematically and as lawyers, we don't know how to do that. So we are working with colleagues at the university from sociology, from social work, from Rashan, and from city and regional planning who do know how. And we are really looking, for example, we give advice to, um, promising ideas for public initiatives to advance racial equity. What are the process ideas that could make that work? Um, and as we, um, as we do that, we've already ended once after listening to, to some of the operating uh, ones, and we do this together with Rashawn, I should say. Um, and uh, now we are really looking systematically at students coding, the meetings, looking for what's effective, what's not. We're doing a series of interviews. We're going to bring some of the, the members of four or five of these commissions together to talk about what they've done. Um, and uh, then we will surely amend our advice and say, sorry, we were wrong about this. Uh, so research becomes a part of it and a part that we at least can't do as well in the law school as, as the rest of you to the fact that um, while we feel like we've made a difference in some of these communities and we welcome the opportunity to do that, um, we are barely making attempt in terms of the whole nation. Um, and we would like very much to have others take this to scale in their own ways, with their own ideas. Um, I think what we feel confident about is that we at the university, if we're modest about it, uh, can in fact have an impact with the knowledge that we've gained. Uh, and those of you who have been leaders have an opportunity, I think, to, to, to from that standpoint as well. Um, and so we, we are in the process of trying to figure out how it is one 
gets others to uh, to pick up the ball as well and, and move with it. We know could as well as we can. Um, and you know we have some concepts. Um, the Justice Department has now asked us to work with them to train people, and we did the first training in December with the Justice Department with about sixty people in various state and local groups that might create the infrastructure to, to recreate what we do at a local level uh, or a state level. And some with um, have actually created that state infrastructure for reaching out in a couple of cities. So that's encouraging, but still not enough. Um, we try, you know, we try speaking all, practically everywhere that we can. Um, ourselves for awards. <laughs> Maybe I want to get them too. Um, uh, we wrote, uh, you know, we wrote an article about um, one of the heroes in a different community in the community of Sanford, Florida, after the department case, trying to inspire people to be that hero in their community too. Uh, but I to hear from from you and I know TK, you're going to moderate this, but I, I uh, and for those of you who are on the Zoom, uh, questions, but also ideas for us, criticisms. Questions. I notice, in fact, I don't get on it very much anymore. Something called Upper Point Neighbor News that it's just infested with trolls. And every time somebody makes a comment about the neighborhood, Northwest Columbus, there's somebody who's gonna write maybe several, something divisive. Have you found evidence of this in the work you're doing and perhaps in the evaluations you've done? Uh, not since the quality of qualitative ones um, are, are talking to people who are themselves working on trying to approve it. But we have certainly response to our, our research um, on the initiatives, public initiatives to advance racial equity. Um, there, are, there are groups who will take a 60 page report and look for certain terms and then the box will start. You know, 1619, critical race theory. Um, they, will, they will respond to those words. And the director of the Community Relations Service Department recently told us that in one community where there had been a race-based uh, divisive situation, that they did a study and that half of the social media um, comments what was going on came from offshore. Uh, and so we do need to know that that may be beyond our control and yet, uh, at least at this point, right beyond the control of collaborative project, maybe not beyond the control of regulation or law enforcement, um, but it's very much a part of what people are reading. And the, the artificial intelligence is so good that you really can't tell. Whether it's you, Joe, writing it from your home uh, in the neighborhood of the, the, where it's occurred, or whether it's someone from Russia or China or Iran. Good question. Thank you. That's very interesting, and it's a new model for me. I'm still taking it in. So I want to ask a question that I'm not sure at all fits the model you've been describing, but certainly. <laughs> One of the bitterest controversies we've observed around campus in recent years has been around the Strauss case. And it's one in which, and I know we can only talk, talk hypothetically here, but among the things one sees, I think, are tremendous differentials of power on the two sides, um, as well as strategies of deferral by those in power and that sense of profound inequities that would be, you know, and I was trying to think through and I thought, I don't understand this model because 
I don't understand how it would address a controversy that is as bitter as this one. Well, I'll speak uh, generally because I don't know enough of the right. details uh, of this particular conflict, but in general, power differences are a huge part of, uh, of the discussions of these issues. Um, and bitterness also. So those two elements are, are almost always there. Um, and with respect to power, one of the things that uh, one looks at is the right time. Uh, and society doesn't always translate perfectly to power within the conflict. Sometimes Going to take went around. Um, there was a great heaviness and sadness, but there was also energy to 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 do something. It changed the power differential considerably, and so I think part of it is that. But part of it also is um, is helping is reframing. You know, it is helping the leaders see. And it doesn't always succeed. You know, this collaborative stuff. Sometimes fail, right? Uh, but you try it because sometimes it succeeds. And one one thing is to help people to to take a, a, a longer view. And um, there is a great deal of in in our society. There always has been this, but um, that every every gain for one group, people view themselves as part of different groups. Every gain for that group is a loss for another. It's a zero sum viewpoint. Um, and then you just wonder, does, you know, suppose it's the Irish immigrants because it happened with them, you know, they're jobs. Uh, we've got to keep them out and while we're still more powerful than they are. Uh, it's easier to talk historically, I think, than about current issues. Uh, and uh, in that setting, there need to be voices say that we all gain. We all gain in safety. We all gain in economic advancement when everyone in our community has that opportunity to succeed. Those two things happen. To speak out about the sum of it, to talk about how much we care that every member of our community is safe and flourishing and that we, we advance. So I think these are you do strategies that don't always prevail, Julia. Uh, and sometimes it's just waiting until the power shifts and then you move in. But but I think there are ways, even I think there are ways for people to speak out for them. Um, and say, you know, distrust for, uh, for institutions. Towards distrust the FBI without reason, you know, just make it up, gin it up. We all lose when that happens, and um, and we have a long term gain if we can follow some of these respectful norms. Another question back here. I'm wearing trifocals, but I still can't see your name. It's Ellen Ellen Jason from oh, the, from the law school. Actually. Uh, so Julia's question made me want to change the question I was going to ask to be kind of a follow-up, which is you've been speaking about uh, working with leaders and one could look at what you're doing and criticize it as being top down mm -hmm. and your focus on planning ahead for eruptions of violence and how the community, the leaders in the community will the violence also seems kind of top down. Mm -hmm. So, but you also mentioned um, everyone having a voice in these decisions. So, so how does that come together in, in sort of a practical sense? The people who would be demonstrating and causing violence. Um, fit into this equation? Um, I think, you know, what we say is we're trying to do a lot with uh, 
two part-time staff and a group of volunteers. So we need to pick what we can do and hope that there are other people out there doing what they can do. They also, and why not deal with Congress? You know, um, well, that's obvious, but <laughs> or you know, there are there that it is more typical um, for leaders. It, well, we think it's a step forward for leaders to be picking leaders from the community who are real influencers and sit down with them. Uh, and that's the only way we think that they can lead effectively given the level of bitter polarization there is. A great next step to have every neighborhood, uh, all the way to the grassroots because these are the grass tops that we're, are doing that we uh, we get calls from people from the community saying, how can we help and so one of our students wrote uh exactly what you mentioned which is a guide you can use to invite your neighbors in to begin talking through what what is it we share you know what and what do we care about and how can we convey what we care about uh and so we Just that we know if we spend a lot of time on it, we would do what we, we think is our strength. But we would, you know, whenever somebody says we'd like to do this, fortunately, there are other groups doing just that, and we try to match them up. We have a question in the chat. Okay, let's see. Looks like uh no there's probably a mile uh, okay can you can you see that answer i sure can and i it's it's a question we we're hoping you will tell tell have give us an idea brian about uh, <laughs> <laughs> but what what we're currently doing we're trying to get others rather than expanding what we do at ohio state hugely we're trying to get other universities and attorney general's offices and other groups who have could host it to reach out to do something similar. So here, here are our ideas, we hope, but make for example that one state attorney general's office was thinking of hiring community outreach workers. And so we called one of our alums who would know the head of the civil rights unit at that, um, that AG's office and asked her to introduce us. And then we sent her an article on how you could do that. Uh, and the head of the civil rights division there read the article and called us and said, we want to talk, we're going to do it. We will, our community outreach will be like this. Uh, and then they said, we want to train our, our staff. Uh, and so we brought them to, uh, they came to Ohio State and we put them in our mediation class and we trained them pretty well uh, and met with them separately about how that could work. So some of it is that, and it is, it's the state of New Jersey uh, AG's office and civil rights section. It is operating and doing a, a great deal of work. Uh, another was our former director. Uh, she went to California, uh, family move, and um, she became the head of a section within the civil rights organization for California. And she, using our materials, and then sending some of her mediators to be trained here um, has started basically uh, a community relations service like the Justice Department has for the state of California. So we've had those kinds of successes. We've asked for a grant. Uh, if we get it, then Fordham Law School and Stanford Law School will both begin offering academies like they're offering. We're coming to one chapters, then we'll go help them with theirs. They will get a following of hundreds of of people 
who will they will stay in touch with as well. So we feel like these are haven't worked, <laughs> Brian. Have ideas. We have a question from Jose. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jose Morales Crispin. I am the DEI director for the Office of the Public Defender's Office. Oh. Um, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate your lecture. My question is uh, how we can move towards more of a holistic approach in public defense, and how can we use the Dubai Committee Project to provide either best practices or educate our lawyers on how to identify how to work with community leaders? the particular viewpoints with the community leaders or uh, work with them to help bridge difference? Both. Just try to have a better understanding on how they can collaborate and partner with community leaders to try to understand how just improve legal defense. Well, I think uh, I, you know, I am an advocate too, so I, uh, I understand both viewpoints. The one thing we haven't done is train advocates. But um, we, we do see advocates as part of the community leaders that uh, in, in, all, in every meeting we have civil rights leaders, for example, uh, as part of the group. Um, and I think that they, and they have groups like advocacy agency has always supported the community relations service and the justice department and budget hearings knowing that you need both things. You need the strong advocacy, but you need a place for that advocacy to occur where you can collaborate and solve some problems and find the areas in which there is some common ground. Uh, and so um, that we should have an offline conversation because there is such a group growing in Columbus uh, and it makes sense for the public defenders to be a part of that. Um, we, we, it, it operates off and on, and it's sometimes called the Greater Columbus Community Trust. Um, and it gathers together some public officials, some community members to talk, what can we do for the community? It's hurting right now, or what can we do about this issue? Uh, so we'll have a conversation. Thank you. Eric. Um, to kind of tie a couple of different things together, you mentioned that one of the first thing you did was to try to identify what worked and what didn't work. And I gather that that's still an ongoing effort. Uh, take Joe's original comment about the uh, bots who were inciting problems. Uh, in principle, you could turn this around and use AI to search the vast information on the internet about what has worked and what has not worked. Oh, that's fascinating. I, I, we have thought about it in the other way, which is you can put your own message out through AI. Yeah, you can, you know, tell the leaders that you, know, you, can, you can do that. But to look at what's worked and what hasn't worked, that's really a fascinating concept. Um, we have, Ellen and I, a colleague who, was part of our study of what has happened with these broad-based racial equity initiatives, um, studied what's going on during them in social media. Um, but this is yet another question, Terry, that you raised that I'm gonna take back to the group. Thank you. So I'll build on what Terry said. You might actually get involved in training individuals who would be responsible for responding when bots and trolls uh, attempt to be divisive. It would be, a, I think, a rather prestigious community role for some people. Because they have become influencers as well, don't they? I, I have a, just a small experience of a blog about the Amish and every once in a while somebody will get on and say things like those Ohio Amish should go back to Wisconsin where they're from. And I'll get on and I'll say, oh, the first Amish community was in 1808. The first one in Wisconsin was in 1934. <laughs> Simple, you know, nothing dramatic. Yeah, good for you. 
That's wonderful, Jeff. We just need more jokes. <laughs> um, our Zoom group. Well, thank you, Nancy. You're very welcome. Someone help me out. Uh, those of you who are on uh, the steering committee, our next Lecture is what date in, in March? 14th? No. March the second. So it's uh, March 1st. Oh, same day. Hey, Mark? Sorry. You see the topic? Yeah. <laughs> We have a lecture mark. We just don't know what the topic is. Well, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, for me, this has been an exhilarating question. I I did have another question, um, and it was this. It, it, it had to do with the comments that were going back and forth between Joe and Terry. A lot of people don't know this about me. Uh, one of my first jobs out of college was working in gang control in the city of Philadelphia. And what we were talking about with leadership, Ozzy uh, mayors and so on and so forth, the lead things. That involved because at that time, the city of Philadelphia led the nation in the number and percentage of uh, uh, teenage deaths, primarily because of the gang issue. And so the question became, how do we come together to address this with leadership? Uh, what happened was, a program that was created between the feds, the state of Pennsylvania, and the city of Philadelphia. You want to know what we did? Mm -hmm. um, the leaders of gangs in Philadelphia have a particular name. They're called runners. That doesn't mean that they ran the streets. We're, we're using the word run differently, meaning I run him. Okay, everybody got it? We hired them. We gave them money. And was the gangland problems reduced somewhat? Then the money dried up. You can imagine what happened. I, I, I give that example because lots of times those who should be at the table are not. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you about that. What, with that kind of population, what would you in terms of bringing those kinds of people to the table? Um, the people who run it as you did or the people who are the gang leaders? The gang leaders. <clears throat> One of the things that we talk about is um, who's affected by the situation and if they are, and who are the bridge, bridge makers. Uh, uh, and you need both every time. And so if, if that's the case, uh, that uh, um,
as long as their goal is not violence, <laughs> um, um, then we, you know, we would we'd say, why not? You know, have the conversation, think about it, consider it. Um, uh, and um, so it, it's tough uh, in situations. Sometimes, if it's not gang leaders, because that's not been politicized so much. Um, um, or it doesn't hit a fault line in society. If it's an extreme group that hits a fault line, um, group, uh, most leaders will not want to meet with those leaders, even though they may be affected by mm -hmm. what's going on. So they will say no. There are ways that uh, that law enforcement can listen to those folks, convey what they're talking about, convey things back. But the leaders themselves probably would never sit across the table. So I think there are lots of considerations, some of which we in the Divided Community Project don't know uh, and can't appreciate. Uh, so we raise the questions uh, and um, say, in general, we've learned this. In general, it seems to make sense uh, to listen and to let the public know you've listened to. But there are exceptions. And sometimes program, um, you can be more effective at the meeting and conveying it just as the public defenders might be more effective than their clients in conveying. Uh, sometimes they'll say, listen to one of our clients. Uh, we want light of this issue. Uh, so we want to bring a client and the leaders might say, Yes, or they might say no, um, depending on the situation, but at least you raise it and you discuss it. I think it's an excellent question to See you what your answer tells me, and I may have it wrong. Um, relative to bringing people to the table and having some effective communication, there's a certain strata of society we would not invite. Well, we would invite, but maybe not the leaders. So when in some situations, they, the leaders, for whatever reason, will not sit down with particular groups. Um, and what we counsel them to do in a situation like that is either to use Justice Department mediator or one of ours and let, let us shut it so that the conversation, the exchange of information uh, and the respect and still occur, um, but uh, you know it is. It's first of all difficult. Uh, suppose uh, uh, an organization is is uh, advocating violence. Um, there, you want the people there to feel safe. Uh, they want to be safe. They want their families to be safe, and that becomes a part of the calculus. But in terms of, um, of going out and listening to people in the community who care just as their leaders do about the community and who are peaceful people, I think there's no controversy. And it, it becomes something that should be done over time. In the midst of a conflict, sometimes there's not the time for it. Um, the best you can do is talk to the people who talk to them uh, because decisions have to be made uh, with public feels about those decisions. Thank you. Thank you very much.